بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Hajj brothers and sisters is a journey to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's a journey to the house of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam in surah al-Hajj in surah number 22 verse 27 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَأَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ Allah SWT says and proclaim to mankind the call to Hajj وَأَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ And Allah says that there will come to you on foot and on every lean camel they will come from every deep and distant mountain highway to perform the Hajj Right, Ibn Abbas, he says that when Ibrahim السلام, completed building the Kaaba, so he was building the Kaaba with, with Ismail السلام, after he completed building the Kaaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala co- commanded him to make this call for Hajj. So Ibrahim asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Rabbi, wa ma yablughu sawti? Oh, oh my Lord, who will my voice reach? At this time when Ibrahim السلام, built the Kaaba, nobody's there in Mecca. Right? There's very few people, it's a, there's like, who's going to hear the call of Hajj? Allah SWT tells him, he says, you know, أَذِّنْ وَعَلَيَّ الْبَلَاغ Just make the call and I'll take care of the rest. It's upon me, Allah saying, it's my job to let the message reach the people. And so he made the call, he says, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْحَجِّ إِلَى, إلى الْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ O oh, mankind, it has been prescribed to you to perform Hajj to the ancient house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, And the narration says, فَسَمِعَهُ مَنْ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ he says that everything between the heavens and the earth heard this call. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused everything to hear the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then the hadith says, أَفَلَا تَرَوْنَ أَنَّ النَّاسَ يَجِيْءُونَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْأَرْضِ يُلَبُّونَ Don't you see that people come from the most distant lands, all coming saying, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ Calling, answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Hajj, brothers and sisters, is a pillar of Islam. Hajj is a pillar of Islam as a hadith says, بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ عَلَى خَمْس Right, Islam is built upon five pillars, right? As shahada, the, the testimony of faith, that there's no one worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, and then what? The five daily prayers. Wasawmi Ramadan, right, and giving zakah, and then fasting Ramadan, and then wahajj al-bayt, wahajj al-bayt, and the journey to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And without these pillars, there is no building, right? This is the basics. This is what we all learned in Sunday school when we were, you know, five years old. When from the earliest days, we learned the five pillars of Islam. Right, Hajj is one of the pillars of Islam, and without the pillars, there is no building. Right, the rest of Islam is built upon these pillars of Islam. Right, the rest of Islam is built upon these, this foundation. And those of you who have gone before, who, how many of you have gone to Hajj before? Show of hands. MashaAllah, a lot of people have gone to Hajj before. So, those of you who have gone, you know it's a life changing experience. Right, there's nothing like it. And every year when Hajj time comes, the heart has a strong emptiness, this longing to go back to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every year, like you'll find yourself on Google, you're at work or you're at home or whatever, and you're just Google imaging the Kaaba. Or you're going to like channels that stream the Kaaba and you're just watching the Kaaba and filling your heart with the memories of Hajj from before. It's a life changing experience. Because it's not just a journey of the body, it's a journey of the heart as well. It's not just a physical journey of the body, but it's a journey of the heart. Lives are changed. Lives are completely changed by this journey of Hajj. But here's my question to you, brothers and sisters. What about the millions of people who have never gone to Hajj before? Millions of Muslims have never gone to Hajj before. Let's take it a step further. Right? You can, if you think about it, the overwhelming majority of Muslims actually don't have the ability to perform Hajj. Right? And we'll briefly talk about it soon. What are the, the, the requirements that make you, that make you uh, obligatory to go to Hajj? Right? The majority of Muslims don't have the ability to go to Hajj. The majority of the Muslims will have spent their life and they'll pass away having not performed Hajj. They haven't performed Hajj. So my question is, for 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 it to be a pillar of Islam, upon which the religion is built, how is it that so many people won't perform this one pillar? How is it a pillar if so many people can't perform this pillar? Right, and the answer is brothers and sisters that Hajj is not just for the Hujjaj. Hajj isn't just for those who are going to Hajj, Hajj is for everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj, in the next ayah after Ibrahim السلام, makes a call, in verse 28, Surah Al-Hajj, he says, لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ Allah says that they may witness benefits that are theirs. He says, لَهُمْ لَا 
they, they own, this is ownership. These are benefits that they are supposed to get from Hajj. Right? So there's benefits from Hajj. There's lessons from Hajj. There's principles from Hajj that, brothers and sisters, you and I should learn and apply in our life whether we've gone for Hajj or not. Whether we are going or not, whether we have a chance to go right now maybe, and, and, and how your life is, you have no, no uh, prospect in the near future of being able to perform Hajj. You just don't see it happening. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to learn the lessons from Hajj. Right? So, brothers and sisters, that's why this class is so important and, and unique is that because this course has three main goals. This whole course, today and tomorrow, three main goals. Number one is that we cover the fiqh of hajj. So I want everybody to leave tomorrow night being comfortable with the different situations of hajj, what's required of them, what are the, uh, you know, the differences of opinion, and what, can, what they can do every step of the way. And we'll go through the footsteps of the Messenger of Allah through the whole journey of hajj. And we'll also cover the difference of opinions amongst the imams. Number two is to cover in depth and the focus of the course, the spiritual aspects of hajj. Right? So you understand every step of the way what you're doing. Every step what it is that you're doing, what's the meaning, what's the spiritual benefit behind it, what's the life-changing lesson behind saying labbayk Allahumma labbayk? What's the life-changing lesson behind wearing the ihram? Right? Every step of the way we're going to stop and look at the spiritual aspects. And number three, as we said, for everyone else, lessons that you can live your life by. So whether you've gone to hajj or not, inshallah ta'ala, you live the life of someone who has gone to hajj before. Because brothers and sisters, every aspect of our worship, Every aspect of our worship has an external component and also has an internal component. Right? Those of you who attended Sweetness of Salah a few months ago, we talked about the internal components of Salah. Right? Salah, physically we just pray Salat al-Maghrib. Right? But spiritually, how much of it were we actually there for? Were we actually concentrating on? How, much of us, how, much, how many of us remember what we said in sujood? Like, did we make dua or not? Or was our mind focused on something else or whatever? There's an there's a spiritual, uh, an internal component of, of the act of worship. And similarly, Hajj is no different. There's a very powerful multiple, you know, internal lessons that we should learn from Hajj as well. Why is this course important? As I said, it's very unique. It's de dedicated for the Hajjaj and the non-Hajjaj. And, and here's the thing, for those of you who are going to Hajj, often the people who get to go to Hajj only go once in their life, right? Maybe if you're lucky, you get a second chance, right? Majority of people, if they go, they go once, right? And it's a big investment. You're taking two to three weeks out of your time. You're paying anywhere from six to up to $20,000 for the premium, premium, luxury, five-star, you know, they bring the jamara to you kind of package, right? That's a large amount of money, a huge investment you're making. And it would be t a terrible tragedy if you spend this much time and this much money and you go there and you don't get the benefits that you need to get the benefits of, right? Isn't that just, it's, just, it's foolish, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a worthwhile investment to put the time in to learn about Hajj and so that way you get the most out of it, inshallah ta'ala, when you go. Now, before we get into the, the, you know, the topic today, prepare your provisions, let's just cover some very uh, basic things about Hajj. Number one, what does Hajj mean? What does Hajj mean? And I'll share with you the shara'i meaning, the, the, the religious meaning of the word Hajj, and a little later we'll cover the linguistic meaning. Hajj, brothers and sisters, in Islam, it means to set out to the sacred house in Mecca, to set out to the house of Allah, the Kaaba in Mecca, in order to perform specific rites at a specific time. Again, Hajj, simply put, is a journey to, that you set out to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Kaaba, to perform specific rites at, specific, at a specific time. And as we said, it's a pillar of Islam. When does it become ob obligatory on someone? The majority of the scholars, they hold that it is wajib al fawr. It's obligatory as soon as possible. Meaning like, as soon as you meet the conditions, it's obligatory. Right? So what do they say? What that means is that if you delay Hajj and you had the ability to go, you met the conditions, and we'll talk about it in a second. If you met the conditions for Hajj and you didn't go for Hajj, you are sinful. You've committed a major sin. It's the equivalent of someone, the time for Salat al Dhuhr comes in and they don't pray Salat al Dhuhr. They don't pray Salat al Dhuhr, Asr comes, Maghrib comes, and they miss the prayer altogether. If you had the means to go, think back in your life. If you had the means to go to Hajj a year and you didn't go, then you have committed a sin. And if you didn't know that, what if you didn't know? You have also committed a sin. You have still committed a sin because this is basic knowledge of the religion that everyone is required to have. You can't plead ignorance on this because this is just like how to make wudu and how to pray. These are basics of the religion that we have to, we're required to know. And it's remarkable how few people know about Hajj because Hajj is oftentimes, 
it's, uh, it's considered something, uh, I'm only going to do when I have to go for it, right? I'm going to learn about it when I have to go, if that. Majority of people, they don't even learn about it until then, they learn about it when they get there, asking their imam, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, critically important that we perform hajj when we're able to do so, and what are the conditions? Before we mention the conditions, Umar al-Khattab, he has a couple very interesting statements. Imam al-Dhahbi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he stays in his book Al-Kaba'ir. He says that, he, Umar al-Khattab, he said, I have considered sending men to different cities to see who has made the pilgrimage. Who has not made the pilgrimage, I'm sorry, who has not made the pilgrimage. And he says that, I am going to collect from them the jizya tax. For those who had the ability to go to hajj but didn't go and they haven't gone yet in their life, I was going to make them pay the jizya. What is a jizya? The jizya is the tax that non-Muslims pay in Muslim land. Non-Muslims pay. And he's saying those who had the ability to go for hajj and didn't go and they haven't yet gone in their life, I was going to collect the jizya from them. In another narration, Amr al-Khattab, he says, whoever can afford hajj but did not perform it, there is no difference in his case if he dies while being Jew or Christian. That's how serious of an issue it is. Right? Why did Abu Bakr anhu when the Muslims refused to pay zakat? Right, they're Muslims, but they're saying, you know what, this one pillar of Islam, we have nothing to do with it. We're not going to pay zakat. Abu Khattab, Abu Bakr who waged war against these people. He waged war against them because they rejected one pillar of Islam. So Hajj is a pillar of Islam. So I'm hoping we get an idea of how important it is and how important it is for us to recognize that. So what are the conditions that make Hajj obligatory? Right, so this is some of the fiqh. What are the conditions that make Hajj obligatory? Number one, that you are a Muslim. That you're a Muslim. If you're a Muslim, of course, then it's required of you to go to Hajj. Number two, that you have the sane mind. What they say in the Arabic language, aqil. You have the sane mind. You're, you're a, a person of sanity. If that's the case, then you also meet the second condition. So, being Muslim and being of sane mind. Number three, the third condition is to be in a state of uh, adulthood. Yani balagh, someone who's reached the state of adulthood. Now in America, once you're 18 years old, you're, you're an adult, right? Once you're 21, it's legal for you to buy, buy, buy alcohol. Right? That's, that's how they have it. As if when you're 20, 20 years old and in 364 days, you still, you, it's not legal. And something all of a sudden changes when you become 21 years old. Right? In Islam, adulthood, you're responsible for yourself when? As soon as you reach puberty. As soon as you become an adult, and it could be 10 years old, 12 years old, 13, whatever age it is, that's when it becomes required of you. What about someone who performed hajj as a child? Someone who performed hajj as a child, their parents took them to hajj with them. Is it required that they perform hajj again? What do you think? Yes, it is required. The Prophet he said in an authentic hadith, أَيَّمَا صَبِي حَجَّ He says, ثُمَّ بَلَغَ فَعَلَيْهِ حَجَّةٌ أُخْرَى He says, any young man or woman who has performed hajj, then he says, and he reaches you know, adulthood, he reaches the age of puberty, then it is upon him to make a hajj, another hajj. So he gets the reward of the first hajj, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives him the reward of the first hajj, but it doesn't remove the obligation of hajj upon him. So someone who made hajj as a child, he still is required to make hajj again. So the first three conditions, number one is being Muslim. Number two is a sane mind. Number three is balagh, being an adult. Very good. Number four, al-hurriya, being free. Being free, meaning someone who is a slave, back in the day this is more relevant. If you were a slave, you, you know, then it's removed from you the obligation of going to hajj. Or someone who's in jail, for example. Whether by, you know, justly or unjustly. Right now we have over 100,000 people in Syria who've been jailed unjustly, right? In Egypt we have thousands of believers in Egypt who are put on jail unjustly, right? Being sentenced to, to death unjustly, right? These people, whether just or unjust, whether they committed a crime or not, those who are, you know, don't have the freedom to leave, they're in jail, then they're, 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 they're exempt from performing hajj. But those of you who are free, then this is also meets one of the requirements. Number five, al-istita'ah. Al-istita'ah, which means the, the, the ability, the ability to go for hajj. And this, this, under this category falls three things. So in your notes you could put 5A, 5B, 5C. Okay, 5A is the financial ability to go to hajj. Right, hajj is pretty expensive, right? So if you don't have the means, you don't have the financial ability, you know, you're living paycheck to paycheck, whatever it is, you have all these payments you have to make, you're in debt, whatever, then it's not required of you. You're, you're, you're absolved from the requirement. If you have the means, you have the extra $8,000 or whatever in your bank account, $6,000 in your bank account. What's the next 5B five, five is the, 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 the physical means, meaning the, the, the health. You have the health to perform hajj, right? Someone who's in the hospital and he has, he has all the other conditions, but he's hospitalized, then he's exempt. Or he's sick and he cannot go. He's paralyzed, he cannot go. All these things would fall, he would be exempt and he's not required to perform hajj. And the number 
5C, the number three, of, under, under five, is that the, the security to go to Hajj. The security to go to Hajj. And this encompasses different things. Back in the day, it meant something different than now. Um, although now it's still relevant in some places. But meaning like you have a reasonable uh, uh, re reason to believe that you have a safe passage to go to Hajj. For example, someone who doesn't get the visa. This is a little more relevant, right? Somebody, uh, they want to go to Hajj, they have all the means, they apply, but they don't get approved for the visa. Then they're absolved from the obligation, right? They've tried and they didn't get the safe means to, to do so. SubhanAllah, I've seen people who've gone, they've got the visa and everything, they've got the tickets. They go from America, they land in Frankfurt, Germany, and they don't have the ticket to go the rest of the way. It's been canceled and they have to go back home. SubhanAllah. Right? If you don't have the means, or whatever, and SubhanAllah, those who go to Hajj, they're the guests of Allah SubhanAllah. Allah SubhanAllah subhanahu wa chose these people to be His guests this year. Right? It's, it's by invitation only. Right? You can plan all you want, but Allah SubhanAllah is by invitation only. He'll call you to Hajj. Right? So that's, those are the five conditions. And there's the six conditions a scholar mentioned for sisters specifically. And that is that you have a mahram to, to travel with you to Hajj. That you have a mahram with you to travel with you to Hajj. And a mahram is you know, a, a close male relative to you who's, who, cannot, who cannot marry you. Like your husband, obviously if your husband he's already married to you, he's your mahram. Or like father, brother, that kind of thing. Okay? A mahram who can travel with you to Hajj for the sisters. So that's the requirement of, of uh, what makes Hajj an obligation. What about the greatness of Hajj? What are some of the rewards of Hajj? What are some of the fada'il of Hajj? The Prophet ﷺ, he says in a hadith, he's al-umratu ila al-umra kafaratu lima baynahuma wal hajj al-mabrur laysa lahu jazaun illa al-jannah. The Prophet ﷺ says, between two umras that you perform, it wipes out all that's in between them. All the sins in between them, if you perform umrah now and maybe five years later, all the sins in between, wiped out. Then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wal Hajj al Mabrur, and, and, and a, 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 an accepted Hajj, and a Hajj performed appropriately, Laysa lahu jazaun illa al Jannah. It has no reward except for paradise. Just this five days, Hajj is just five days. That's all it is. It's, it could even, it's, it's just five days. That's it. And if you do it right, you get these five days right. And what do we mean by right? The fiqh wise, you're following it, you're getting the benefits of your understanding what you're doing, and you don't do, commit any things that would nullify your Hajj. Laysa lahu jazaun illa jannah Jannah is yours, that's remarkable I mean that's, that's enough of a, you, we don't need to say anything else But there's more, subhanAllah The Prophet he says It's one of the greatest deeds that you can do Aisha radallahu anha She goes to the Messenger of Allah sallam, And she says Ya Rasulullah Nara al-jihad afdal al-amal afala nujahid She says, O oh, Messenger of Allah We see, we consider jihad fi sabilillah To be the best deed possible that one can do the most rewarded deed is to fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we consider. So she's saying, me as a woman, as the wife of the Messenger of Allah, she's saying, we as women, afala nujahid, can we not fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what does the Messenger of Allah tell her? She say, he says, la, la kinna afdal al-jihad, hajjum mabrur. She says, he says, no, but the best jihad for the woman is an accepted hajj. A hajj performed properly that's accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is in Bukhari. Right? So the, 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 ma the, the magnificence and the amount of reward for hajj is remarkable. Number three, it forgives one's sins. Amr ibn Asr al anhu he was one of the companions in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he was on his deathbed, his son came to him and he began, uh, you know, he was in his last moment. So his son is reminding him of the good things the Prophet sallallahu said about him. He's, oh my father, you know, Rasulullah said such and such about you and gave you glad tidings such and such and such and such. So the narration says, Adam al his face was turned to the wall. And after his son said this, he turned, he turned to his son. And then he says that, قَدْ كُنْتُ عَلَىٰ أَطْبَاقٍ ثلاث. His last words to his son, he's saying, in my life, I've gone through three stages. I've gone through three stages in my life. He says the first stage, he says, I found myself averse to none more than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I was not more angry with and more upset with and more hateful towards anyone than the Messenger of Allah said them. And he says that, and there was no desire stronger in me than the one that I should overpower him and kill him. He's saying the first stage of my life, I hated the Messenger of Allah said them to the point that the, my, I, I dreamt, I slept, I woke up, all in my mind was I want to kill the Messenger of Allah said them. And then he says, and had I died in this state, I would have surely been from the people of the hellfire. Then he says, when Allah instilled love for Islam in my heart, and I came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said to me, stretch out your hand so that you, you may pledge allegiance. So he stretched out his right hand to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam struck out his hand, he pulled his hand back. He pulled his hand back. And so and the Prophet told him, what happened to you, Amr? Why did you do that, right? And so he says, he says, I want to lay down some conditions. 
Abdul Nahas, he's about to take the shahada, but he says, I want to put some conditions down on Messenger of Allah. So Prophet says, Tashadat bimada, what are the conditions that you have? And he says, and yughfar li, that I'm forgiven. My condition, O Messenger of Allah, if I'm going to take, accept Islam, is I'm forgiven for all that I've done before. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he says that أَمَا عَلِمْتَ أَنَّ الْإِسْلَامِ يَهْدِمُ مَا كَانَ قَبْلَهَ وَأَنَّ الْهِجْرَةَ تَهْدِمُ مَا كَانَ قَبْلَهَ وَأَنَّ الْحَجَّ يَهْدِمُ مَا كَانَ قَبْلَهَ He says, oh Amr, don't you know? He says, أَمَا عَلِمْتَ Don't you know that the fact that Islam wipes out the previous, previous misdeeds? And he says, يَهْدِم Meaning like it destroys. Like if, you, if you've lived a life so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you've literally built up, a, like you, you've already built like a, a huge home for you in hellfire. Not in paradise, in hellfire. Like you've secured your spot in hellfire. You, you're so established in sin that there's nothing as if you could feel like there's no hope for you. Prophet says that the one who reverts to Islam, Islam yahdimu ma kana qabla. It not just wipes out, it destroys Everything that was before. I want to ask one of the leading enemies of Islam is now brand new slates. And then he says, and also don't you know that hijrah destroys everything that came before, all its sins. And he says, and don't you know that hajj destroys all the sins that came before it. You go to hajj, everything, you're, you're, you're coming back inshallah ta'ala as a brand new slate, as the Messenger of Allah s.a.w. says, مَنْ حَجَّ فَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ رَجَعَكَ يَوْمِ وَلَدَتُ أُمُّ The one who performs hajj and doesn't perform rafith and fisq. He doesn't have relations with his spouse when it's forbidden to do so, and he doesn't perform any fisq. Fisq in the Arabic language, the Arabs would say, فَسَقَتِ الْحَبَّةِ The seed, it burst out. The seed burst out. So what does that mean? Fisq in, in Islam means you burst out of the boundaries Allah SWT has set. Certain things you can and cannot do. So the one who goes to Hajj doesn't have relations with his spouse and doesn't you know, uh, do any fisq, break out from the boundaries that Allah SWT has set for Hajj, then he will come back like the day his mother gave birth to him. He will come back like the day his mother gave birth to him. So Amr al-As, he told the Messenger of Allah SWT, he says, after he said that, he says, no one was more dear to me than the Messenger of Allah SWT. He says, and there was no one more precious in my eyes. And he says, وَمَا كُنْتُ أُطِيقُ أَنْ أَمْلَأَ عَيْنَيَّ مِنْهُ إِجْلَالَ اللَّهِ He says, I couldn't even, after that moment, I couldn't even look at the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and fill my eyes with the beauty of his face out of honor towards him. And he says, and had you asked me at this time in my life to describe the Messenger of Allah, I wouldn't be able to do so. Out of how much I love the Messenger of Allah. And he says that had I died at that time in my life, then I would have hoped that I would have went to Jannah. Then the third stage of his life he says is that, that he says, after Prophet died, all what has happened has happened, and now I don't know where I stand. And now I don't know where I stand. So Hajj forgives one's sins, and not just forgives it, completely wipes out all your previous history. Another of the benefits of Hajj, and there are many, I'll just share this last one for you, is that the Prophet he says, Al-Hujjaj wal-Ummar wafdullah. The Hujjaj and the Ummar, those who perform Hajj and Umrah, the Prophet says that they are the delegation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when you're when you go to meet royalty, you send a delegation, right? Allah SWT is saying that the people who come to Hajj are the delegation of everyone else. So the people who go to Hajj every year, Allah has chosen them to represent all the rest of mankind. To come to His house. The house which He says in the Qur'an, وَطَهِرْ بَيْتِي My house. He says it's my house. So come to my house. He says that, Prophet says that, the Hujjaj and Umar are the Wafdullah in Da'uhu wa Jabahu Mani Stagfaruhu Ghafara Lahum. He says that if they call upon Allah SWT, Allah answers their call. So one of the benefits of Hajj is your dua is answered. One of the benefits of Hajj is your dua is answered. And he says that if they ask Allah for forgiveness, then Allah will forgive them. And this, book, this hadith is narrated in the books of Ibn Majah, and it is Hassan. So what does Hajj mean from a linguistic perspective? Hajj from a linguistic perspective. Hajj literally means Qasd. Qaf, Saad, Dal, Qasd. And what does that mean? That means an aim, a destination. Like you have a goal in mind, right? So like when you shoot an arrow, and the arrow goes to its target. That, the, the, that's what the example of Hajj is. That you're the arrow, the one who's performing Hajj is the arrow, and the target is the bait of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the arrow doesn't waver. It goes straight and it's going to its target and it hits its target. That's the goal of Hajj, right? It means Qasd, to have an aim, and your aim is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's, that, it's Allah's house. Imagine the honor of that, that you're going to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what that means is that it implies if you are a hajj, if you are a qasid, if you're someone who is aimed and focused on their destination, that means you'll leave off any distractions. Right? This is important to understand. 
Very important to understand for the hujjaj and for the non-hujjaj. That when your aim is Allah, you leave off any distractions, right? You leave off any distractions. So leave off any disagreements with who? Number one, most importantly, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have disagreements between you and Allah, meaning you're committing sins that you shouldn't be committing. Number one, if your goal is to reach the house of Allah, you have to leave those sins off. And number two is disagreements amongst the people. To leave off any disagreements that you have with anyone else. And if you don't do so, if you get distracted, you argue with people, you this, you that, when you're in hajj, then you're not, by definition, you're not a qasid, you're not a hajj. You're not someone whose aim is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you this example. If, you're, if your boss at work tells you, by, by, by Tuesday, I need this project done. It has to be done, that's it. I mean, this is the most important project in, in the company. You are the man responsible. You need to have it done by Tuesday. You have five days. To, this is a weekend now, but you will spend the week, even this Labor Day, you will spend this weekend. You know your job's on the line. You won't go to any, anywhere else. You won't go on vacation. You'll cancel your family plans. You know, your son wants to do this. Sorry, I can't. I don't have time. Your friend calls you. Let's go play basketball. Sorry, I don't have time. You know, you have a big exam coming up. Whatever it is, you have something in front of you. Everything else becomes secondary, right? right? Uh, when you have a final exam, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you could hang out. But Thursday night, there's no ball, right? You're going to pull it all nighter and you're going to focus for the exam. Because now it's crunch time, right? It's crunch time. This is, this is it. And that's the example we have to have, right? The one you have a, just a goal in your mind, the one who's performing hajj, that goal, nothing can distract you from that. Everything else becomes secondary. And your, your, your aim, your goal is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're his guest. And you have to understand what that means. Understand what that means to be the guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when we have social gatherings in this world, let's say you have the Super Bowl or you have the, you know, the final four or whatever in your, in your city. And people go, people attend this, this social gathering, a convention, whatever it is. The people who missed out, they feel something. They feel like, oh man, I missed it. I missed the chance to go to this event. I missed the chance to go to this program or this, this uh, sports event or whatever it is. And they feel, you know, it becomes a talk of the town. Right? The people who go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of us brothers and sisters, during the season of Hajj, we should have this longing in our heart. And this sadness in our heart, if we haven't gone, that we're not amongst those who are attending the greatest gathering that the earth has witnessed. The greatest gathering every year that the earth witnesses is the gathering of Hajj. The greatest place is the, the day of Arafah. Right? This is something that we should feel something that we're not there, right? You know, there was an old woman who was performing Hajj. She was with the group and they're traveling to Mecca. And of course, back then there aren't these hotels and high-rise towers and all that stuff. So once you reach the tip of the mountain, you see the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all His glory and His glory manifest right there. So the whole time on the way, she's a blind woman. She's saying, Baytu Rabbi, Baytu Rabbi. You know, when you leave your home and you're going on vacation and the kids say what? You haven't even left out of your neighborhood. They're like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right, you're going to Disney World or whatever it is. They keep asking, are we there yet? Because they're so excited about the, the destination. They're going to Nana's house or whoever. They're this. They, they want to go. Right, so the, the, the old lady, she's saying, Baytu Rabbi, Baytu Rabbi. Like, are we at the house of my Lord yet? Are we at the house of my master? And they were, Kanu yusabbirunaha. They were trying to, you know, make her patient. They're saying, no, it's coming. Relax. Just, you know, take a chill pill. Right, it's, it's gonna, we'll get there. You know, no, we're not there yet. Until finally they... They, they reach the tip and they, they see the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they tell her, هَذَا بَيْتُ رَبُّكِ This is the house of your Lord. And so she, you know, they rush forward to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she grabs on to the, the robes of the Kaaba and she says, بَيْتُ رَبِّي بَيْتُ رَبِّي بَيْتُ رَبِّي And she dies right there. She's holding on to the Kaaba and then she dies right there saying, بَيْتُ رَبِّي Why? Because the inner realization of knowing that, Ya Allah, from amongst the so many thousands and hundreds and thousands and hundreds of millions of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose me to come to His home to be His guest. Who am I? And that inner realization caused her, overwhelmed her so much that she passed away right there in the, in the front of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And brothers and sisters, write this down. That, that to the extent that you, under, you, you, you internalize this understanding of being the guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at His house will be the extent of your experience at Hajj. You understand that you are a guest of Allah at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the extent that you have the experience of Hajj. Right? And when you go, and let me give you a, a, a simple example. You're invited to a king or a sheikh or whoever, some person of importance in this world. And you go to the house and let's say he invites only 15 people. From the whole of America, 15 people, special people are invited to this gathering. 
That's it. And you made, you're one of those 15 people. You know, you'll dress up nice, you'll make sure your hair, you got your hair cut, your beard's looking good, your hijab's looking good. You go there, you show up, and maybe somebody's giving you a hard time. Bothering you, you know, takes your drink, spills their drink on top of your, your shirt, all this stuff. But you know what? At that gathering, when there's only 15 people, and it's the most important person, and you fill it in, whoever it is in your life, you wouldn't bother that person. You wouldn't argue. You wouldn't argue and say, oh, whatever, you'll be patient. Because you don't want to cause a scene, right? And the, 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 that's, the, that's the attitude that the hujaj have to have. That when you go to Hajj, people may get on your nerves. People may get on your nerves, but when the opportunity presents itself to argue, to fight back, to get frustrated, to get upset, remember, you're a Hajj, you're a Qasid, you're someone whose focus is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all these things are distractions. All these things are distractions. So you wouldn't cause a scene. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 197, He says, <laughs> فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرِ يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ Allah says that the Hajj is in the well-known months, meaning Shawwal, Dhul Qada, and Dhul Hijjah. Right, Hajj actually itself falls in Dhul Hijjah, of course, right? But you can leave from, from Shawwal. That's from the time when the, the months of Hajj begin. So he says, whoever intends to perform Hajj therein, then he should not have any relations with the spouse. فَلَا رَفَثْ وَلَا فُسُوق As the hadith mentioned, no fisq, as we just defined already. And he says, وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجْ And there is no arguing in Hajj. There is no arguing. You leave off all the disagreements. Somebody steals your spot in prayer. You're in the front of the Kaaba. You're in the third line. The Kaaba is right there. You could see the Imam. And somebody comes and takes your spots. And you can argue. This is your right. But you know what you say? I know the Prophet ﷺ promises the one who leaves off an argument and he is in the right, a palace in paradise. And I know that I'm in Hajj and my focus right now is not to get into argument. My focus is to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll walk. And you have to walk back. The, the lines fill up. To find another spot in the Kaaba, <laughs> you're not going to have to walk for a while until somebody gives you a spot. Right? But you don't, you don't argue, you don't cause a scene. Allah says, that's why He says after وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ He says وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ Whatever good you do, Allah knows it. So when you're performing tawaf and somebody's elbowing you, pushing you, right? You keep getting elbowed and elbowed in the back and you're turning around expecting some big guy and you turn around and you see this small sister. <laughs> I found in hajj when you perform tawaf, their elbows are the most dangerous. <laughs> they got the, maybe, I don't know why, but their elbows are planted in your back. And you'll get pushed to a point that you are, you're fed up. But instead of turning around and giving, giving her an angry face, frowning at her or saying something to her or whatever, you don't even, you turn around and you smile. And you say, Assalamu Alaikum. And then you make a dua to Allah SWT in your heart that she doesn't even hear. Oh Allah, grant her Jannah. You do that. What does Allah SWT say? وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ He says, whatever good you do, the small thing that no one sees but Allah sees, Whatever it is that you do, Allah is fully aware of it and He knows it. He's aware of it. So brothers and sisters, you're a hajj, you're at hajj, you have to keep your focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, and, and then the ayah continues and Allah says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ وَاتَّقُونِ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Allah says, and take your provisions. He says, and take your provisions. And the best provision is that of taqwa, and so fear me, O men of understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and take your provisions. So anytime you travel, right? You're traveling anywhere, you have to prepare your provisions, right? When I'm coming here, this morning, yesterday night, I was packing my bag. I'm putting my, my clothes in, what I'm gonna wear, you know, I'm gonna have my, my bathroom, you know, stuff, like the toothbrush, toothpaste, my cologne, all these things I'm packing, right? You prepare your provisions. Had you're going for a couple weeks, two, three weeks. So you prepare your, Allah saying, prepare. What does that do? But he says, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ Right, but the best provision is that of taqwa. Where does taqwa reside, brothers and sisters? Taqwa resides in the, in the heart. التَّقْوَىٰ هَا هُنَا So Allah is saying, just as much as hajj is a physical journey, a physical journey when you leave your home and go to the house of Allah it is just as much a spiritual journey. It's a journey of the heart before it's a journey of the body. And so he's saying, yes, prepare your physical provisions, but the best provision that you can take is a provision of the heart, which is taqwa. What is taqwa? What is taqwa? Let me give you a basic example. Let's say you're driving on the highway. The speed limit is 70 miles an hour, and you're going 85 miles an hour. When you're speeding on the highway, what happens? You've got one eye on the, in the, on the median, right? 
checking if there's a cop there, and the other eye is on the rearview mirror, making sure there's not a cop behind you. So you're there and there, back and forth, right? And now you have apps and stuff like the Waze app, right? By the way, I, do, I recommend downloading it. I don't really recommend speeding, but I would recommend downloading it, W-A-Z-E. All right, just a little, I don't have any stock with them, but <laughs> it can save you some tickets. Basically, you could flag a cop, so it gives, it's like a user-friendly thing. You can flag cops if you see them. Anyway, so you got your app open, you got your eyes in the medium, eyes in the back and stuff, and you're, and you're uh, keeping a lookout for cops, right? And then you come around to bend, you're looking over here, and the cop is hiding behind the bridge. And you're like, you, right away you get that feeling, that, that, you know, that, that, that hate, that feeling that everybody hates, right? The butterflies in your stomach. So what do you do? You're already ahead of the cop now. So if you stick shift, you downshift, you don't even touch the brakes, right? You know, you put your blinker on, you check your, your, your blind spot, you do the all, like, follow textbook driving, right? And you get in the slow lane, right? That feeling, that's the definition of taqwa. That's the definition of taqwa. The awareness that you're being watched, the awareness that you're being watched, and that, re that awareness causes you to change your actions to fall in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded. Right? That awareness causes you to fall in line with what Allah has commanded. So that's taqwa. So Allah says the best provision you could take for hajj is that of taqwa. Forget your clothes, forget your sleeping bag, forget all that stuff. The most important thing is taqwa. And the second most important is Vaseline. <laughs> for the brothers. <laughs> right? When you wear a harab, you're going to need the Vaseline. We'll talk about that in a second. All right? But taqwa is critically important. Critically important. You have in the journey, you're always aware Allah is watching you. You're always aware Allah is watching you. Right? That's important. Now let's talk about this though. Let's make it a little practical. From the what tazawa do and prepare your provisions, what are physical things that you should take with you to Hajj? So as I mentioned, I definitely recommend Vaseline. Alright, just to put on the inner thighs, because when you're wearing your ihram for those few days, it can get you can develop a pretty bad rash and it can be very painful. So Vaseline, put that on, but get non-scented Vaseline. Right, because you have the baby scent Vaseline and you have the non-scented. Get the non-scented Vaseline. Alright, obviously toiletries, right? You may want to consider even taking toilet paper. Right? Because when you're in Muzdalifa, for example, you may not, well there are some bathrooms, but the lines are going to be huge and you may not be able to wait. Or obviously toothbrush, toothpaste. Um, call your Hajj group to find out if they're going to provide for you a mat to sleep on in Muzdalifa. Right? In Mina they'll give you, you'll have a tent and you'll have a small little like couch type bed thing there. Um, and obviously you'll have your hotels. The only time you'll need like a mat to sleep on is Muzdalifa. So call your Hajj group and find out are they providing, most of them do provide a, a mat for you, so you, you, you don't, may, may not need to take it, but you may want to take it just in case, or a sheet or something to cover yourself. Obviously if you have medications that you need, you take the medications. Um, I would recommend taking a copy of your passport, in case, it's, subhanAllah, it's so interesting is when you go to the, when you land in, in, in the airport, like your passports are just thrown in this like, this back room. Just like millions of people, and it's just like, pfft, in this pile, and it's like, it seems like there's no organization, it's just thrown there. But when you leave, subhanAllah, the passport is brought to you, except for maybe some people who are unlucky, right? Most people, they have a copy of the passport. Some people may lose, their, may lose their ID tag. They'll give you an ID tag. You may lose it. So you want something to, you know, for proof of your identity with you. So a copy of your passport. The other thing is, that's honestly like, is a big problem is, is this. The, not the cell phone itself, but the camera, right? The problem is, is that people, they're in Hajj, they're making tawaf, and they're taking like selfies. Right? <laughs> they're like, like, they're trying to get it like with the multazim right behind them, the door of the Kaaba, and they're trying to get it perfectly, and then somebody smacks them, and they get upset, and they argue, and their phone falls, they almost get trampled. Look, brothers and sisters, I strongly recommend toss the cameras. Don't bring them. Right? I mean, you take your cell phone if you need it for making phone calls or whatever, you want an app for Hajj or whatever it is, or the sweetness of Hajj, you know, the guide, inshallah, you guys get tomorrow when you register. We have a, a pamphlet. You want to take the digital version, you have it on with you. All these things. That's fine, but the, beware of all these, this, this selfie culture, right? Of taking pictures of yourself every step of the way of Hajj. Right? Hajj, the yashhadu manafi alahum. Witness benefits that are yours now. Live in the moment. Don't think about you know, getting the perfect Facebook profile pic, right? So I can have myself and the Kaaba and everything. Just don't do that. It's going to spoil your Hajj. Don't forget about the cameras, forget about the pictures. Just live in the moment, experience, experience Hajj. All the spiritual benefits, experience it. Don't, don't worry about all these, these pictures. Now, Here's a lesson for the non-hujjaj, right? We said that the most important journey in the life, the, 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 the most important provision on the journey of hajj is taqwa. And similarly, Allah SWT says, Ya ayyuhal insanu innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadahan famulaqi. He says that, O oh mankind, verily you are returning to your, towards your Lord with your deeds and actions, a most definite sure returning, and you will meet the results that thereof. Right? We're all on this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the moment we're born, we've all also embarked on a journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just like the most important provision of hajj is taqwa, you may need in this life, you'll need a car, you need a home, you need you know, clothes and all that stuff, but the most important provision of this life to get you ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also the provision of taqwa. It's also the provision of taqwa. 
So brothers and sisters, this taqwa is a critical component of not just hajj but our lives. And after taqwa, those of you who have gone to hajj before, I think you'll agree with me in saying that the second most important provision is that of? He's got it on his shirt. <laughs> sabr, patience. He's wearing a shirt that says sabr, patience. Patience, patience, patience. Write it in gold, circle it, highlight it, put every single color of the pen, every single color of the rainbow on your notes. Patience. You will need a very healthy dose of patience in Hajj. I repeat, you will need a very healthy dose of patience in Hajj. Understand, brothers and sisters, from now, that things will go wrong. Things will not go according to plan. And that's, that's just the nature of Hajj. Things will be disorganized, you'll come across people who are rude, you'll find long lines to the bathroom, you maybe have to wait three hours to get into the bathroom. When you get in there, you have somebody, as soon as you're in, they're banging on the door to get out, right? And then you go into the bathroom and it's like not clean at all, right? You may, you're on the bus, going from Mecca, Medina to Mecca, or Mecca to Medina, right? This long journey, and guess what? Out of all the buses, it just happens that your bus got not only stuck in traffic, but the AC broke. So you're sitting in this bus with no AC, with a bus full of 50 people, and it's hot in this middle of the day in the Saudi Arabian sun, and you're sweltering. Everything that will go wrong, that can go wrong, may go wrong. So prepare yourself, right? You may find, you will find, unfortunately, a lot of trash. People will litter, right? People are coming from all over the world. Some don't know better, some do know better, but they don't care. And they just litter the streets. When you're, if you walk from Mina to Mecca or Mina to... to walk different places, you'll literally, you'll be walking through trash. You'll be like walking through trash. Right? And that, that could like get, get on your nerves and it should bother you because a believer doesn't like that. A believer likes cleanliness. But you have to be patient. You have to be patient, right? You might get lost. You're in Mina, every tent looks the same. Every tent looks the same. And the, and the, and the problem is all the, like the security there or you know, the people, the government officials who are there, they're there not for directions. They're not given a course on who lives where. So the only people you can go to for directions are those people. And you go to them and they have no idea. They don't know where you're supposed to go. So they can't help you. So it becomes frustrating. And you will lose your patience. Right? You could go to throw the jamarat and you have to go an hour walk back and you have no idea how to get back. You have no idea how to get back. And hopefully go with your group and somebody can guide you. Maybe you get lost. I mean, there's millions of people there. It's easy to lose, lose your group. Right? So, to get back is difficult. You can get lost. It's very hot. You may be, you know, in Muzdalifah, you're sleeping on the rocks. In Mina, when I went for their first trip of my Hajj, when I went back in, you know, several years ago, you know, I didn't have a tent in Mina. The tent was full. They didn't have a spot for me. So, I had to sleep outside, you know, under like, right underneath the bright, you know, white, you know, those big like parking lot lights, you know, those huge lights. I'm sleeping right under this bright light and I'm right next to the buffet table. And the chai is there, so always everybody's drinking their chai, right? They have to have chai. So everybody's drinking their chai and they're eating their food. And I can't get rest. And it was winter time. At the time, it was December when I went to Hajj. So it was very cold at night time, right? I didn't have that. You have to have patience. We went to Mecca the first night after leaving Mina. Guess what? Sorry, your hotels aren't booked tonight. You have a reservation for tomorrow night. So all your group got to sleep, figure it out, but you're not sleeping in the hotel. I paid my money, I paid my, I want my premium package, I'm from America, here's my American passport. Doesn't work, doesn't work. Your patience will be tested, right? And so you have to prepare yourself for that. You may have things stolen. Your, your ship ship, your chapel, your sandals, expect them to be stolen. And honestly, the people of, of there, they don't, they don't consider it stealing. Right? Because it's just kind of like you go into the masjid, and there's like a sea of sandals. So when they walk out, they just grab whichever sandal and they walk out. So if you grab somebody who's better sandals than you, khayr wa barakah, inshallah. <laughs> now, I don't recommend it. And I, don't, I, don't, I want, definitely want that responsibility of having somebody else's sandals. Right? So if somebody takes your sandals, go buy some new ones. Okay? It takes, make sure you have some money. At the end of Hajj, my first trip, because I lost my ID badge, I went with um, cashier's checks. Don't take cashier's checks. Right? It's, it's just a big headache. Don't do it. Just take cash and, and you'll be fine. Okay? And just, just try not to get it stolen. That's other trouble. But I didn't have, I couldn't, I couldn't cash my cashier's check. So by the end of my Hajj trip, I didn't have any money left. And so somebody stole my sandals. So I'm walking barefoot the rest of the time. So one of the, the groups, the groups in the Hajj, one of the groups in, uh, one of the members of the group bought me some sandals. But the point being, things will get, your money make, when I was uh, making dua and jamarat, after the jamarat, after stoning the jamarat, we'll talk about it tomorrow, inshallah. Somebody stole uh, money from my pocket. I have no idea how. I was focused on the dua and boom, my money's gone. Right? Cell phones will get stolen, your belongings may get stolen. Things will happen that will test your patience. And so, I wanted to do an exercise with everyone. And this is where you need your notes. What I want you to do is to draw, to draw, um, 
uh, three circles, okay? Just like you see. Or two circles. If you can, the out outside borders are also were there. You want to draw a third circle? It's up to you. Okay, so the first circle, inside the first circle, I want you to write my patience, okay? And then, and then what are you going to do? It's on here. It's not on there? Huh? It's not on that side? Oh, it's not on over here? Uh, I, I don't know. Can you guys see it? Okay, so that's fine. Um, so a circle, you're going to draw a circle, and you're going to put um, inside the first circle, I want you to write my patience, okay? And then go ahead and write in there, everybody right now, write things that when they happen to you, that you are patient for. Write things that when they happen to you, you're patient for them, okay? You're patient for these things. So I put on, the, this is an example, uh, people being rude to you, people cursing you, and getting sick. Okay, this is just an example and everybody could be different. These are just some examples I thought of, okay? So these are things when happen, you know, you probably will get second heads. You might get like a sore throat, you know, cough, all that stuff, fevers, whatever. You might get some GI upset and all those things. Maybe that's what happened, but you're typically, when you get sick, you're patient because you know the reward of Allah SWT, whatever it is. Somebody's rude to you, you know what? Brush it off, keep moving forward, you're not worried about it. These are things that you're typically patient for, okay? So write down some things that you're typically patient for inside the first circle. Inside the second circle, I want you to write down things that are kind of 50-50. Sometimes you're patient, sometimes you're not. Right? So the things I put down. Being shoved. All right, somebody says something to you, fine. I'll be patient. But when it comes physical, when somebody puts, puts their hands on me, when they push me, all right, now it's on like Donkey Kong, right? Now we'll take it outside. We'll take it outside the haram. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. But we've seen it happen. People break out fist fights inside, doing tawaf, and there's fist fights. Right? Or you might be doing the wave. People trying to get to the black stone, what happens is they get lifted up above the crowd. So you see them like surfing on the crowd until somewhere they drop and Allah must add after that. If they can land on their feet or land on their head. Because they land on their head, may Allah help them. Right? So things that you may be patient for, you may not be patient for. Unsanitary conditions. Maybe that's something that you just, you're a clean freak, you hate when things get dirty. Maybe that's what's something that's going to bother you. And the last thing, disorganization. Maybe that's what bothers you. All right? But this is kind of an exercise that you need to do and you figure it out yourself. Things that you may not be patient for. And then the outside, the second circle, in the third circle if you drew, drew one, is things that you are absolutely going to blow your gasket for. You never are patient for this. Right? No food. You come home and the biryani is not ready, you lose your patience. <laughs> the, the table is flipped and everything, and it shouldn't be that way. Prophet when he came in his home, he put etar on before he comes in, so he smells nice for his wife. And he gives nice words and stuff, right? But maybe somebody loses patience when there's no food. So guess what's going to happen? You're supposed to have the food delivered at 3 o'clock and it doesn't come. You're waiting. Oh, it's coming at 6. And when it comes at 6, they say, oh, sorry, you can't eat it. Because guess what? It was outside too long in the sun and we can't let you eat it because it may be, uh, it may be, um, it may be kharab, it may be spoiled now, right? So you don't have lunch today. You don't have dinner today. It may happen. And for some people, it may be, you know, being taken advantage of. When I went on my first Hajj trip, you know, a long time ago, I, I wanted to go with my Qur'an teacher. At the time I was doing my you know, memorization with the teacher, so he said he's going to Hajj. I said, okay, I'll go with him. Right? And so what happened was I signed up for the Hajj group, I paid, I was going to go with him, and then they took me out of his group and put me in a different group. And they charged me $300 more, although I was leaving four days later. So I had a shorter trip and I had to pay more money. And then our group that I was put in didn't even have an imam, let alone my own teacher who I was close with. I didn't even have an imam altogether. Our group didn't have an imam. So this is something that I get upset with. Like, um, certain principles, like being taken advantage of, I, I get upset. Right? This was my test. And it didn't start at Hajj. It starts before Hajj. Right? This happened before I even left for Hajj. So these are things that I want you to write down that you never are patient for. Okay? Then, what I want you to understand is that you understand this, brothers and sisters. All those things you wrote on the outside in the red. Those things on the outside, the, the second circle, in the third circle. Those are things, expect that you will be tested with those things. I repeat, expect that you will be tested with those particular things. Okay? This is an important exercise to do because when you mentally picture, you see in front of you, what is it that I am not patient for, and you understand that tests will come your way, this will help you when the tests do come, that you will be patient. This, will, this is critical. So I want everyone to do this exercise. If you didn't do it right now, then definitely do it at home. And obviously you can see how this applies for non-hujjaj, right? This is very, very simple. That one of the goals of hajj is to improve your character. And one of the goals in life also for you is to be to improve our character. The Prophet said he was only sent to perfect character. He was only sent to perfect character, sallallahu So our character should be improved through hajj. When you come back, you come back very different than when you went. 
Right? Similarly, for the non-hujjaj, your character should also be there. So what are some tips, brothers and sisters, to have patience? Number one, understand that Allah Subh'ana says, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Allah says, most definitely, we will reward those who are patient with a reward that has no bounty. That has no bounty at all. We will reward those. Who, so Allah Subh'ana gives specific rewards for the shuhada, for this, for that. They have specific rewards. As for those who are sabir, those who are patient, they will have a reward that Allah Subh'ana Ta'ala has no limit set for it. Right? Allah, the angels will say to the people of paradise, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fani'ma uqubaddar. Peace be upon you for your patience, and excellent indeed is the final home for you. Right? Number two, remember that all of you have given up so much to go to Hajj. Don't lose it for something so small, so insignificant. Right? You're going to lose your Hajj because of a one night in a hotel that you were supposed to have that you didn't have, you have to sleep in the street. How much is that? $200? $300? You'll spoil your hajj for $300 for that one night? Think about it. Because you're going with the mindset of, of, no, I paid for this, I want this. But don't lose, just put it in the grand scheme of things. Don't lose your hajj because somebody pushed you. Don't do it. Don't lose your hajj because somebody cursed you. Or because you didn't have what you were promised. It's not worth it. Number three, this is important. Write this in gold. Forget about your rights. Forget about your rights. When you, people go to Hajj, they say, I paid $8,000, I want every penny of this $8,000 that I spent. And if I don't have my five-star, eight-course meal, then you know what? We're going to have a problem, right? People fight, people argue, people get upset with their Hajj leader. And yes, there, I'm not saying there isn't a problem of Hajj leaders and Hajj groups taking advantage of the Hajjaj. There is. There is that problem. But you know what? Hajj isn't the time to deal with it. There's another time and place for that. But when you're in Hajj, everything that comes your way, take it with stride. Push it away. Don't lose your hajj. Right? You know, the, uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, you know what he says? He says, no fikr, just dhikr. No fikr, just dhikr. Don't worry. Fikr in, or, in, or, in Arabic, it means like contemplation. In Urdu, it means worry. <laughs> right? You know, you're worrying about something. Right? So he says, no fikr. Don't worry, man. Just dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anytime you're about to get upset, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Allah masalli ala Muhammad. Subhanallah Muhammad subhanallah. Make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No fikr, just dhikr. Put all those things aside. Forget about your rights. Right? Forget about your rights. Be giving and forgiving. Be giving and forgiving and not demanding and requiring. Okay? Be giving and forgiving, not demanding and requiring. Number four, dealing with the crowds. Dealing with the crowds. How, brothers and sisters, if you're not claustrophobic before Hajj, you will be after Hajj. Because <laughs> you are in crowds that are, that are sometimes can be just push you to the limit. In, in tawaf, you could be in a point where you're literally body to body, everybody around you, you don't, you're not controlling where you're walking. You're just kind of like, just going, just going like the water pushes, the, you know, things in the, in the river. Right, in Sa'i, I remember there was a time when the first time I went to Hajj, what happens when you enter the Sa'i, when you make the first turn after Safa, people are all joining, there's all these new Hajjaj coming in to perform the Sa'i, and you have all the people there. So you get this crushing effect on the opposite side. So people were up against the wall, being crushed against the wall. I mean, I think people died that day, right? They're being crushed there, right? And so you, the, the crowds can be difficult to deal with. And as you, one day, two days, five days, 10 days, 14 days you're there, going to the masjid is a task because it's three million people all going to the masjid, right? So it's difficult, it's challenging, right? So don't let the crowds get to you. Don't let the crowds get to you. I remember one time, <laughs> subhanAllah, <laughs> you know, I was in, we were on the way to Muzdalifah. We were on the way to Muzdalifah and I, uh, the, the bus got stopped, it stuck, got stuck in traffic, and we couldn't go. We were moving for hours. So we got out of the tent, you know, the truck, the bus, I didn't know what to do. So I, I, one of my group members had a, a phone to call, so I used it to call my imam in Michigan, one of the imams that used to be the imam in our masjid. And I called him and I said, Sheikh, he picked up. I said, Sheikh, I'm in Hajj right now. <laughs> he says, oh, mashallah, he says, what's going on? So I was like, I have a question. He says, the bus isn't moving, or, you know, we're stuck, what do I do? He says, go walk. And I was like, well, I don't know, it's my first time in Hajj, I don't know where to go. He's like. He was telling me, he's, mashallah, he has a white beard, white hair, and he's saying, why aren't you walking? I'm, I walk when I go to Hajj, and you're a young man, you're not walking. I said, Sheikh, I don't know where to go. He says, just follow the millions of people, it's not that hard, right? So I was like, oh yeah, good point. Right? So just follow Yellow Brick Road. Just follow all the people where they're going, right? So if you're ever alone in Hajj, chances are you're, you're in the wrong place. Because you're never alone in Hajj. There's so many people there. But the thing is, the crowds will get on your, on, on, your, on your nerves. So this is my advice, how you can deal with it. Because Hajj requires you to get to another level. This is what it is. Allah SWT, He says, 
He says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طِبْتُمْ فَدْخُلُوهَا خَالِدِينَ Allah SWT says the people of taqwa, again the provision of hajj and the provision of life. You want success in your life? You need taqwa. The people of taqwa, they'll be taken to paradise in groups. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا when they get there, the gates of Jannah will be open. Before they're open, you know what the hadith says? The Prophet ﷺ says that, وَلَقَدْ ذَكَرَ لَنَا أَنَّمَا Utbah bin Ghazwan, he states that the Prophet ﷺ, he said to them, وَلَقَدْ ذَكَرَ لَنَا أَنَّمَا بَيْنَ مِسْرَعِينِ مِنْ مَصَارِعِ الْجَنَّةِ مَسِيرَةُ أَرْبَعِينَ عَامًا وَلَا يَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمٌ وَهُوَ كَذِيظٌ مِنَ الزِّحَامِ He says, so I said to them that, the distance between two of the sides of the gates of Jannah is the distance of 40 years in travel. 40 years in travel is between two sides of the gates of paradise. 40 years, in, it takes one day to get to Mecca. Imagine how wide the gates of paradise are. 40 years of travel. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said, there will come upon the gates a day in which it will be overcrowded with people. Meaning the believers will be crowding around the gates of paradise, rushing to get into paradise. They're trying to get in. They're all there. Just like Hajj, you have millions of people. Right? You're doing tawaf and you're in the people. You're in this group and you're trying to get, to, to get into Jannah. The Prophet says there will be a day that there will be so much crowds around the gates of paradise from all the believers trying to enter paradise. Why am I sharing that with you? Because anytime that, brothers and sisters, the crowds get, to your, get on your nerves. The crowds get on, they start bothering you. Then what I want you to do is remember that there will come a day when you'll be in crowds just like this except you will be at the gates of paradise, insha'Allah. So this moment of difficulty will now become a moment literally that could be spiritually transformational. You could literally start crying, saying, Ya Allah, I'm surrounded by your guests. In a gathering at your house, oh Allah, surround me with similar people around the gates of paradise. It could be a remarkably transformational experience. Just understanding that. And the last thing I want to share with you about, about, about this topic is that about patience is see the positive things and don't be overwhelmed by the negatives. I know they said five minutes. Is it okay if I take five more minutes? And I'm, I'm almost done with this session, inshallah. I'm so sorry. I just have one more exercise I need, to, I need to do with you. And that is this. Don't see the negatives, see the positives. What, you, what do you see on the screen? A black dot. Anybody see anything else? White space. All right. So the first thing we said is right away we see the black dot. Then we said, mashallah, we see the white space. This is the example of Hajj, when you, and it's an example of life. When, you, when you're driving your car, and you get that big old bug just goes poof, and it smashes on your windshield, right? Even though the rest of the windshield is, mashallah, you just got a car wash, it's beautiful, that one spot, you keep seeing it, right? And it gets on your nerves. You're like, man, that bug. If it wasn't dead already, it would be dead now, right? You know, you're like, I'm so upset with it. The black spots are easy to see. Right? The black spots of Hajj, the, the problems in Hajj, this argument, this thing, this no hotel, this, that, the black spots will stick out. But what happens is, look at the screen again. Look how many white dots are on the screen that we don't see. Right? We see this one black spot because it sticks out and it bothers us. But there's so many countless white dots. You're a guest of Allah in the best days of the year, in the most rewarded days of the year, doing the most rewarded, one of the most rewarded actions at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't get better than that. So these small tests that come your way, push it aside. Focus on the positive. Be positive. Don't be negative. And don't be in your group. And if somebody's in your group and talking about, oh, this group, you know, they promised us this and they didn't do this and we're supposed to have a hotel and we're waiting for eight hours for the bus and blah, 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 they'll go on. Get out of that gathering. Don't be there. Because it could take a few rotten apples in the group, a few negative people in the group, and the whole group becomes negative. Keep it positive. Keep it very positive in your group. Think of the positives and don't focus on the negatives. Think about the positives and don't focus on the negatives. Brothers and sisters, Hajj is a journey of the heart, not just of the body. Many will be the passengers to Hajj, few will be the Hujjaj. Many will be the passengers to Hajj, few will be the Hujjaj. Be amongst those who are the Hujjaj and not just the passengers to Hajj. All right? Lastly, the Prophet ﷺ will close with this. He says that, ثَلَاثَةٌ فِي ضِمَانِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ He says three people. Three types of people are in the care and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, رَجُلٌ خَرَجَ إِلَى مَسْجِدٍ مِّنْ مَسَاجِدِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ A man or a woman 
who leaves to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, 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 the masjid from the masajid of Allah. So all of you right now are in the care and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're here in the masjid, inshallah ta'ala you're in the care and protection of Allah. Then he says, وَرَجُلٌ خَرَجَ غَازِيًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And a man who leaves fighting in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A mujahid fi sabil Allah, he's also in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, وَرَجُلٌ خَرَجَ حَاجًا And a man or a woman who leaves their home to perform hajj, they're also in the care and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa to bless us all with the ability to perform hajj and not just hajj, but perform with the hajj mabrur. Inshallah ta'ala, if not this year, in the coming year. And we ask Allah to bless all of those who are going to hajj with an accepted hajj. So jazakumullah khairan. Um, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow 10 a.m. we'll meet back again. And we'll start with the overview of hajj. So please try and come. Please bring family, bring friends. Inshallah ta'ala, it'll be a great experience. And we're going to go through every step, physical and Spiritual fiqh and spiritual aspects of Hajj inshallah ta'ala Before you get up, we have a special presentation inshallah from uh, one of the brothers about uh, Islamic wills So please give me your attention, jazakum khairan Wa akhiru da'wan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh